Hi, everyone, and welcome to Radio Cloud Native from Rantus, where we break down the week's news on Kubernetes, the cloud native landscape, and the wider world of tech. I'm Eric Gregory. And I'm John Janeshake. We're back after a week away, and we've got a lot of news to catch up on. We'll dive into PyTorch's big move from Meta to the Linux Foundation, the hum of data centers in Northern Virginia. A new, terrible problem. <laughs> new DevSecOps guidance from the NSA and CISA, and a whole lot more. To start us off, John, can you tell us a little bit about the state of API security and development? Sure. Um, an article over on Container Journal posted, I guess, uh, about a week ago by Bill Dorfeld, pointed out that Salt Lab's state-of-the-art API security uh, report, which was released for Q3 2022 last week, um, enumerated a 117% year-over-year increase in API-based attacks. Mm -hmm. uh, Dorfeld quotes John Morello, VP of product at Palo Alto Networks, noting that APIs are prone to data overexposure, particularly REST APIs, and that traffic, but not exclusively REST APIs, and that traffic to and from them, obviously, tends to be complicated and involves relatively arcane requests and uh, often tends to retrieve more data than absolutely needed for a transaction, in part because it's often easier, I guess, to request a bag of JSON and uh, sift through it on the client side. <laughs> this, in turn, means that policing uh, REST API security or any API security requires, tends to require more intelligence to understand transactions in context, uh, make sure that you're not forbidding the necessary ones and, uh, and uh, recognizing when things uh, evil are going on. Basics, uh, however, the, the, uh, the uh, Salt Labs report notes are, are also important. The, the principle of least privilege and zero trust is, is the foundation. Just-in-time privilege escalate, uh, escalation in Kubernetes uh, and potentially other systems is a way man to manage it. Uh, Morella also says that web application firewalls um, popular, obviously, aren't always the right or whole solution for defending APIs, uh, since the 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 WAP um, uh, architecture is too generalized. Once you get into configurable APIs, traffic and in and out can take use case specific forms, and generalized tools will need to be adapted or supplemented to recognize and make decisions about this stuff. Um, uh, Morello also makes the point that REST isn't the, OP, uh, the only API style going. You think uh, GraphQL, gRPC, and other types of API are all uh, running out there, and security solutions need to know about all of these to create effective barriers to exploitation. Um, continuing in the security uh, and API domain, Postman, my obviously, I'm not sure everybody's, but many people's favorite REST API exploration and munging toolkit <laughs> released their state of the API report for 2022. Uh, and as you might expect, investments in API development and integration are going up again, as is the amount of time programmers spend working with APIs. The past three years have seen consistent increases here. Uh, and respondents to the survey indicated that their orgs are now spending, and this kind of blew me away, are now spending more than half their productive time in API-centric work. Yeah. Um, there's also evidence that uh, that orgs are are finally creating real momentum behind uh, use of internal APIs, development and use of internal APIs to standardize interapp communications. How well an API integrates, meanwhile, with internal apps and systems is now the number one reason decision makers are choosing to use one contender or service over another. So people who are building SaaS apps for corporations um, should you know take this into account that being compatible with what's already running is very important. Uh, as to what APIs are in use, Postman is probably getting a pretty good view of this because they're so widely used. Salesforce APIs apparently top the list. Hmm. Probably no surprise there. Yeah. And quite a few productivity suite apps like Microsoft Graph, Notion, Zoho, and similar are, are right up there in the rankings, uh, as are the, the, the usual suspects like payment APIs, DocuSign, and, and several key communications apps, including Twitter in the number two spot, uh, Slack, uh, of course, and WhatsApp. Um, more intense, less mashup-y dev-centric APIs like MongoDB are, are actually at the bottom of Postman's general list, unsurprising considering the number of independent programmers, non-enterprise programmers, and, and, and other kinds of developers um, uh, mashing around with APIs uh, you know, in, in very highly trafficked sites. Um, and it would be interesting, I think, to see broken out uh, a list of databases and components frequently encountered in cloud native environments as a sort of a subset of these, since the numbers, uh, you know, are 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 probably uh, you know uh, out of scale to the extent that uh, that more information could be um, uh, could be 
pulled from the stats if the numbers were graphed together. Yeah. For me, it feels like a big takeaway of the post report is how many new people are coming into API-centric development. Um, clearly, this is growing fast. It's growing faster than ever. And it's potentially scary that almost half the people working in APIs today have less than two years of experience. <laughs> it, it points up the need, as the first story noted, for good security standards and tools, secure from the start engineering protocols and other best practices to avoid security problems. Interestingly, though, the Postman report uh, says that another, I guess, still partly hidden cost of naive approaches to using and designing APIs may be growing over dependence on microservice design patterns. Um, you know, microservices being components that just do one thing, so have very simple APIs, which are easy to design in theory. Um, and that this much use of microservices driven by the need for simpler APIs and controls is something potentially that can bring with it its own problems. Not every uh, application should be broken down into microservices, or at least not all apps should be broken down the same way. Yeah, um, yeah that's a conversation we've seen going on uh, continuously, I think especially over the last year, saying uh, a little backlash to the backlash, uh, you know, do we actually need microservices? And, you know, the answer is yes, but their their use cases aren't universal. Uh, you know, there, there are times when something should be a monolith. Um, and, you know, identifying those cases is a big, big part of the job, right? Definitely true. Even given that microservice design, like 25, 30 years ago, designing anything in parallel, multiprocessing design, was a fascinating challenge that many programmers wanted to rise to because the intellectual, you know, the, 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 you know, avoiding thrashing, the kind of problems that you run into these environments are just not the kind of problems that you run into when you're writing linear bash scripts or, you yeah. know, tiny little basic programs that play tic-tac-toe. <laughs> um, you, you know, that's of course talking about my, you know, revealing my age again. <laughs> um, if I may go on, although you're probably tired of hearing my voice, um, I ran across uh, what I thought was a really close to optimal tutorial in the Kubernetes space um, this morning, and I wanted to bring it in. Um, Bob Raselman, uh, who uh, dropped this tutorial yesterday in Tech Target, where he offers a really gentle introduction to namespaces, really 101 level. Uh, in, in Kubernetes, uh, along with a lot of working code, just exactly what you want to see in the tutorial, to set up and use hierarchical namespaces, which are uh, not something that ships with um, with uh, with Kubernetes out of the box. We can be relatively easily installed and the kubectl uh, API extended to make use of the new verb HNS. Um, hierarchical namespaces are a, a fundamental tool for managing access and visibility of resources in, well, multi-tenant Kubernetes clusters, but they're useful in any shared cluster. It it really it, you know it really is the right way to to handle permissioning. They 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 let you in, provide in an intuitively clear way. Well, depending on how good you are naming things, but <laughs> they give you a domain subdomain type hierarchy um, that enables very precise permission grants lower down and more general permission grants higher up very easily. So you don't have to change 190 things if you want to change something for everybody. You know, um, the article is, it, it, it's a terrific tutorial. It's as close to a, an optimal tutorial as anything I've seen. Um, uh, it goes into real detail about how to install the hierarchical namespaces plugin, which, you know, as I said, doesn't come with gates out of the box. Uh, it includes conveniences like short enough for mere mortals to read and understand bash scripts for doing setup, this setup, and installing the kubectl CLI add-ons um, that support that HNS verb. Uh, that you need to make hierarchical namespaces. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the tutorial cl closes very simply with having to build a minimal sample set of namespaces for a multi-tenant application. It is a, a beautiful thing, and it should take about an hour to go through, uh, maybe on a freshly deployed small k zeros cluster or something like that. Seems well worth the effort to me, unless you're already crazy expert in this aspect of uh, cluster architecture and operations. I honestly wish I had written this thing. <laughs> well, I'll have to check this out. That sounds great. Um, so for our, our next story, it kind of calls back to uh, your previous concern about having a lot of API developers who uh, maybe only have two years of experience, aren't going to have a firm grounding in security best practices. You know, that that's a, a wider concern in the cloud native space right now, right? So uh, here's a bit of a resource to help there. 
earlier this month, the National Security Agency, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence jointly released new guidance aimed at developers and intended to help harden software supply chains. The document titled Securing the Software Supply Chain Recommended Practices Guide for Developers is exactly what it says on the 10. It's a list of DevSecOps best practices developed under the Enduring Security Framework, or ESF, a public-private working group coordinated by the NSA and CISA. The group is releasing the document as entities across the public and private sectors remain focused on risks in the software supply chain, especially in the wake of the SolarWinds attack and vulnerabilities like this winter's log for shell both of which are explicitly cited by the document. As many teams or at least security experts try to shift security left towards the developer side, this kind of resource is designed as a bit of educational support, providing some basic supply chain security grounding. The guidance is broken down into four major categories, all phrased as imperatives, develop secure code, verify third-party components, harden the build environment, and deliver code. Under these general umbrellas, the document covers everything from expected refrains like vulnerability scanning and SBOMs to less common topics like the security dimensions of code reviews. The guidance is about 60 pages, but roughly a third of that is appendices. It's kind of like Tolkien. Uh, so it's not a massive read. If you're <laughs> looking for up-to-date developer-focused security guidance, you can check it out by navigating to the press room page at nsa.gov, and we'll share a direct link in the chat for live viewers. We should do something where we go through this with some of our engineers and 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 really take it apart, maybe some sort of a panel discussion about this. This is a you know critically interesting stuff, doubtless by smart people. I mean, I know some people who work for these agencies, and you know they are creme de la creme kind of folks yeah. uh, and and their their advice is uh, you know is often good. Um, they are also, of course, dealing with um you know, as you said at the beginning, a similar talent crunch uh, to everybody else. They're trying to become more productive with newer programmers, and they need to systematize this stuff, or the missions that they are all on will be compromised. And so, you know, listen closely to these folks. They are highly motivated to help you. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great idea. We'll, we'll have to talk with some folks, see if we can get that panel discussion going. Well, sticking with security, um, on Monday, the Kubernetes SIG security team announced the alpha release of an official programmatic CVE feed, which auto-refreshes with reports of critical vulnerabilities. Uh, you can access that feed through a web interface at kubernetes.io. We'll share the full link in the chat. Or you can use the JSON feed, which we'll also share. The SIG security team is actively soliciting feedback in order to graduate the release. So if you have thoughts or you'd like to help out, you can head to issue one at the Kubernetes slash SIG security GitHub page and contribute. Very awesome. Um, that is uh, keenly interesting to see this uh, bred up to the level of, of, of you know, project governance. Um, yeah. There are... Obviously, lots of sources being maintained by very smart people and very active things, but this is, you know, this is taking real responsibility for something extraordinarily critical. Um, continuing on this, apparently security was was the, you know, in the air today. The watchword today. Um, an article uh, just out by Robert Lemos in uh, Dark Reading um, uh, was based on Orca Security's State of Public Cloud Security Report for 2022, also just out. Um, which says that most cloud data breaches require, at this point, a sequence of just three steps by attackers uh, to, to gain uh, access to the crown jewels, as they say. 78% of attacks now start with exploitation of a known vulnerability, and obviously, just to name the elephant in the room, we have all witnessed scenarios where even when scanners and other tools point up the CVEs and they're right there in front of you, folks click on won't fix for various, no doubt, good seeming reasons. Uh, the obvious takeaway here is don't do this and police those base images like a maniac pruning away the brown spots continuously the way you do with those late summer peaches. You know, they're they're still edible as long as you take the brown spots off. Um, the other thing the Orca report pointed up, and it's a little scarier, is that lots of people seem to have disabled two-factor uh, you know, authentication on one or more, or in some cases, all of their highly privileged cloud administrator accounts. Obviously, this is convenient, but it's a terrible idea that gets people into trouble. Such accounts are potentially vulnerable to password spraying and other brute force techniques. Um, Orca also noted that 
About 12% of companies have at least one internet accessible workload whose password is weak or has been leaked. Um, and this does not sound like fantasy to me, knowing how stuff happens in, in cloud environments and how sometimes unpoliced stuff happens in cloud environments. Um, everybody is in a hurry and mistakes are made, as they say <laughs> in government. Um, the other unstated takeaway, though, is that public cloud security isn't the big problem here. That Not that there aren't potential issues, including the complexity of permissioning systems on public cloud, uh, public clouds, which are perpetually, a, you know, a problem simply based on their ability to confuse operators. Um, but most of the worst security problems are still being created by users, and they will presumably go with users onto wherever you know to wherever their workloads travel, which means they will exist on private clouds. Potentially, they will exist on uh, edge clouds and any place with internet exposure. All right. Uh, so shifting gears a little bit from uh, security world to more Linux world, I suppose. Um, over in Linux world, this month has seen a lot of movement around Rocky Linux, specifically the assembly of a new leadership team at CIQ, founding sponsor of the distribution. Before we go any further, we should note that Marantis also sponsors Rocky Linux, and we're big fans, so we're not disinterested observers here. Um, but we think we have legitimate takes. So uh, for a little background, the Rocky Linux project started when Red Hat ended development on CentOS proper in 2020. Rocky's meant to pick up the pieces and provide a reliable open source distro for enterprises. It's owned by the Rocky Enterprise Software Foundation, a nonprofit created by CentOS founder Gregory Kurtzer, intended to keep the distribution open source with firm nonprofit ownership and open source, open source governance. And it's been a big hit so far, getting as high as 750,000 monthly downloads. So the purpose-built corporate sponsor, CIQ, is really a company in its infancy, just founded in 2020. They had a Series A funding round of 26 million this May, and now they've announced that a group of Linux veterans have signed on to the leadership team, which now includes Kircher himself, who is co-founder and CEO, and Art Tide and David LeDuc, founders of the 1998 Linux support company, Linux Care, who will serve as VPs of business development and marketing, respectively. In an interview with IT World Canada, Kurtzer says that CIQ is there to support Rocky Linux and not the other way around. He says, quote, we're, we are here to help with Rocky Linux. We're here to be a part of it. We don't see open source as a business model or a marketing switch that you turn on or off, depending on corporate wins. Instead, we look at open source as a way that we can collaborate with the community, unquote. He goes on to say that the governance rules of the Rocky Enterprise Software Foundation are constructed such that CIQ could not take over ownership of Rocky Linux, even if it wanted to, if there were some future change at the business uh, or whatever else. Uh, if you are interested in checking it out, you can download Rocky Linux at rockylinux.org slash download. This is definitely what you want to hear yep. from stuff like this, is it not? Yeah, making um, pretty making pretty ironclad commitments. You're hearing language like this will always be open source. Uh, yeah. The the intriguing thing is that of course two thirds of the leadership team or critical leadership positions are occupied by people who understand how to support Linux, you know, as opposed to build distros, mm -hmm. which implies that you know there's a monetization path for these folks that you know, can be exploited materially and others clearly believe in them if they got $26 million. So, you know, good on them. I, I sort of feel like, you know, these things should not be incompatible and, and, you know, I, you know, I wish them a lot of luck. This is very interesting. Yeah. Likewise. And uh, it's, it's one to watch, I think. Speaking of things to watch. Uh, so we got the news this week from the Linux foundation that it is accepting PyTorch from Meta nay Facebook. PyTorch is the pivotal platform for AI, machine learning, and deep learning that has developed a rich ecosystem over the course of its incubation at Meta under the AI team there. As Jim Zemlin writes in the announcement blog for the Linux Foundation, quote, if you peel back the cover of any AI application, there is a strong chance PyTorch is involved in some way, from improving the accuracy of disease diagnosis and heart attacks, to machine learning frameworks for self-driving cars, to image quality assessment tools for astronomers, PyTorch is there, unquote. According to the blog, PyTorch is among the five fastest growing open source projects by commits last month alongside Kubernetes and the Linux kernel. 
The Linux Foundation argues that with neutral ownership, PyTorch will be well positioned to double down as a ubiquitous industry standard with users being able to trust that it will continue to be maintained as part of the commons. Kind of related to that last story. So this feels pretty big. Certainly the foundation's messaging around the story is just like vibrating with excitement. Their emails, their blogs. Uh, how significant is this move, do you think? It, uh, well, they ain't lying that this thing is everywhere. Yep. Um, it, uh, you know, and it's appearing continually on resumes that we see and other, you know, sort of evidence that, you know, it has established itself as a standard. People assume that, the name of the of the package will be recognized, uh, you know, and and that familiarity with it will advance their careers, and that's what happens, you know, when tools become important. Um, it, it's um, it, it, it's interesting, and I guess nice. I you know I don't want to, you know I don't want to 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 necessarily join, but I will at least acknowledge the idea that. Meta owning everything in the world, including the underlying framework for all of AI, <laughs> <You know? laughs> is not a really comfortable idea for me. And that, you know, they are welcome to build all the 3D virtual worlds that they like and uh, walk around without legs in them. But, uh, but uh, you know, I, I do think that something like this should be run, you know, for the benefit of the commons. Um, and Linux Foundation, obviously, is, you know, they're the the you know the big uh, the big uh, um, unicorn in the uh, you know in the in the house of commons uh, maintenance of open source software projects. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I think that's the that's the big underlying story here, right? Is this foundational AI technology moving into the commons uh, away from that private ownership? I think that's. Uh, quiet cause for um, <laughs> a sigh of relief, perhaps, or a, a small, okay, yeah, that, that seems good. Especially since also it, it is increasingly familiar and increasingly in use at universities and, and other places where people are learning fundamental techniques, you know, in Absolutely. AI development. And so will inevitably become, you know, um, a, a, a part of projects or have, influence over projects, even if it gets replaced at some point in project evolution with other tools. Um, you know, these things tend to impose a style on, on, you know, creating GANs and, and training them and, you know, on cloud architectures used, you know, to scale them out and, and on all other, you know, kinds of stuff. I haven't really built a map, but, you know, of, of how that works, but potentially it's very interesting how quick this stuff can scale to enormousness. Yeah, even um, just for continuity of research and like academic and medical spaces, I think that's well, this is a, a such a welcome absolutely. sign, right? I mean, you, <laughs> have to have, you have to have shareable data, and you have to have shareable logic, and the only way to do that sometimes is to stay within the constraints of a particular package used to generate, you know, artifacts. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm trying to think well, of a segue, but I, I, I'm not coming up with one. There, there is no segue to this, but it's a critically important story. I mean, you know, times times have changed. I, 50, 60 years ago, you could, uh, you know, you could buy a house in Northern Virginia and and walk down green shrouded lanes and uh, and uh, um, hear nothing worse than, you know, pneumatic hammers breaking rocks in the quarry, you know, down the down the pike a ways. Um, <laughs> Now, in the 21st century, this story today dropped from Associated, Associated Press saying that the citizens of Northern Virginia, which is now a huge center for cloud data center hosting because of May proximity, DC proximity, Beltway Bandit proximity, and a bunch of other stuff, are um, up in arms because data centers make a ton of noise. Uh, a protest organized by the Great Oak Homeowners, uh, Homeowners Association is bringing this matter to the, um, well, I was going to say streets. They are streets, but they're green and suburban and kind of restful seeming, except that they aren't, says Dale Brown, head of the association, who was interviewed at a protest near the a newly opened AWS data center in Prince William County. Um, according to Brown, these data centers create a constant low, low key hum that's very annoying. Uh, and uh, indeed, he says he remembers the local quarrying operation, which was driven out by the data centers as being easier to live with. So, you know, I guess in principle, we have 
we have uh, some empirical proof for the assertion that crypto mining is more disturbing than actually breaking rocks, right? Mm. <laughs> uh, you know, I think, I think the protesters are looking at it wrong. I think if they were to listen more closely, to listen more carefully, they'd hear that elvish songs are actually playing from the aws data centers uh <laughs> resonating straight from you've, from you've been watching that new lord of the rings series <laughs> haven't you so have we all <laughs> um this is really interesting though i've been seeing um more and more talk about the data center dominance of northern virginia and it really is just one of the absolute top uh uh data center dense locations in the entire world um in a way that's that's quite surprising um coming in over a lot of major metros um it, it, it's just such a massive center i guess dating back to you know early work with darpa um and uh you know farther back than you might think uh, yeah yeah no there's there's important reasons i mean they put the maze there for a reason and that had to do with darpa too and yeah. you know so there's lots and lots of fiber under the green fields of Northern Virginia. <laughs> I was, uh, I've lived there. I, uh, I was born in Virginia and, uh, yeah, it's not, it's not quite, you know, the Valinor of the elves, but, um, maybe, maybe someday. And someday you will return to the Western lands. <laughs> I, I hope not. <laughs> well, or maybe you'll move to Rockville or for my sins. Yeah. Maybe With better um, Japanese restaurants. Uh, so, Shifting gears a little bit, a more somber story. Before we move on, I want to pause to observe the passing of Peter Eckersley, the trailblazing technologist, security expert, and privacy advocate who died this month after a recent cancer diagnosis. The odds are pretty good that your browser is right this very moment running an extension that Eckersley was directly responsible for. As a leading force behind the Electronic Frontier Foundation, he was the creator of ubiquitous security and privacy tools like HTTPS Everywhere, Privacy Badger, and Let's Encrypt. Just this year, the EFF announced the sunsetting of HTTPS everywhere in 2023 because they determined that it had accomplished its goal of promoting HTTPS only modes in all of the major browsers. And I just think that's that's so incredible, right? How many projects reach sunset because they finished the work and the work was making the internet safer? I mean, that's 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 quite a thing. Um, so Eckersley work. Eckersley's work had an incalculable global impact, and we owe him a debt of gratitude, not just in the tech world, but way beyond. Uh, our, our thoughts are with his loved ones and those who knew him. And um, no good way to transition, but we'll end on a lighter note. Uh, so we usually end our show with uh, a quiz of the week about kind of weird things happening out there. Uh, so I've got an item for John this week, and my question for you is this. Uh, let's see here. We talked a little bit um, a couple shows ago, I think, about curl creator Daniel Stenberg. And on Twitter last week, Stenberg posted a URL that is surprisingly valid for both curl and for browsers. So what is that URL? For both curl and browsers. Yep. And I recognize that the guessing space here is vast. Uh, just here's a, here's a URL. What is valid it? for both. Does it have something to do with escaping backslashes? I have forward slashes, I should say. Yeah, you're, that's warm. Gosh, I haven't the vaguest idea. I will embarrass myself. No, not, not embarrassing at all. This one uh, and, surprised a and lot of worse, people. I, I will embarrass this lady who recently joined our family. <laughs> I'm so glad doesn't, you're showing. Doesn't know anything about Curl. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you're showing her on the show. Uh, that's gonna increase the audience tenfold, I think. And uh, that gives me time to share the screen. Uh, so let's see here. This is a good one. Uh, share screen, Chrome tab. The URL is <laughs> HTTP, HTTP, <laughs> HTTP, <laughs> at HTTP, HTTP, question mark, HTTP, hashtag HTTP. <laughs> uh, and this is a great blog post uh, breaking down exactly how and why it is a legitimate URL, uh, how curl is parsing it, how browsers typically parse it, uh, a few other ways. Uh, very, very well worth checking out.
That's brilliant. Oh. All right. So that brings us to a close for today. Uh, so first, I want to thank you for being here, John. Thanks for stepping in for Nick again. Uh, I think you and I are, are going to be podcasting uh, some more over the coming months, which I'm really looking forward to. But looking Nick should be back next week. Um, thanks to Charlotte today uh, for production sorcery. Uh, preemptive thanks to uh, Lewis and DJ for their work on social and video. If you're turning in live, you can catch us after the fact in podcast form. If you are tuning into the podcast, you can uh, join us here for these live recordings, usually on Wednesdays at 1 p.m. Eastern through the Mirantis LinkedIn page. Uh, and regardless of how you join the thing, so. Take care, everyone. Goodbye, everybody.